For those of you who attend here regularly, you know I occasionally struggle with losing my voice. This is one of those days. So I apologize if you lose a word here or there. I'll do my best to yell at you so that you can hear me, but the songs were so good, I sang them anyway, knowing that it wouldn't be wise, but sometimes I can't help it. When you can worship God, and if you don't sing with all your heart, something's wrong with you, and so I can't help that. Last night, as my family was preparing for worship today, Rachel came down the steps carrying one of those square wicker baskets filled with wooden figures and felt and that sort of stuff from our children worship program. She came downstairs and she sat on the floor and said, boys, I have a story to tell you. And you can imagine how excited my kids were because they got to hear a children worship story again. And one of them said, but mom, we already know this story. And that was how it went. As she told them the story of Jesus rising from the dead, they were concerned that they already knew this story. And I was reminded that we know this story too, don't we? We know all about Mary finding the empty tomb and the stone being rolled away and the angel sitting on the stone and how Peter and John both ran to the tomb. Peter left first, but he was old and slow apparently. And John passed him on the way and got there first, but was a chicken, didn't go in the tomb, so Peter had to go in. And we know all of that. And we know how Thomas doubted and he wasn't so sure Jesus was raised from the dead. And he said, Jesus, if I'm gonna believe in him, I gotta put my hand in his side and my fingers in his hand and the holes in his hand. Then I'll believe. We know all this. And it can feel a little ho-hum, a little everyday, like how many times can we listen to the same story again and again? But imagine for a moment that a missionary came to our church today and they started giving us an update on their ministry in Africa. And they told us a story in the middle of that update that there was a man in one of the villages they had been working in who had been cursed by some of the witch doctors and he drowned. He fell into a pond and he drowned and they dragged him out. He was not breathing. There was water in his lungs. There was no heartbeat. He was dead. The next day, he was dead a whole day. The next day, several pastors from the surrounding villages and this missionary came and laid hands on the dead body and prayed for him. And while they're praying, he sat up and was breathing and was alive. Now, if you heard that story, what are some of the questions that you might start thinking about? You might start wondering, well, do you have some pictures? And are they date stamped so I can tell when the dead one was taken, the live one was taken? Because who knows what this order really was. Do you have a video that I could see to know it really happened? Who else was there? Who are the other witnesses that I could talk to? And how do you know he was really dead? What test did you do beforehand to make sure his heart wasn't beating? You know, you're getting up there in age. You're a missionary. Maybe you don't have good hearing and you listened and it was beating, but you didn't hear the heartbeat. Maybe that's what it was. And we'd want to examine the evidence. We'd want to know for sure that he really had been raised. But if we're honest, part of what we'd all be thinking was, you've got to be kidding me. That doesn't happen. When people are dead, they stay that way. I'll be honest, those are all of the questions and thoughts I had in my mind when one of our missionaries came and told me that story six years ago. I thought, that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. But it seems to be true. The Easter story, if we approach it as it is, without of all of our history of Sunday schoolizing it, for lack of a better word, with the cute little felt things on the wall. And we approach it as adults would going, I can't believe this can really happen. How do we know this is true? Is even more mind-blowing than that story of a man being drowned and coming back to life a day later. Because Jesus didn't come back with an ordinary, normal body and then die again like that guy is going to. He came back with a different kind of body. How do we even make sense of this story of Easter? For us to begin with, we should go back to the eyewitnesses. The Gospel of John is the one gospel that's written, along with Mark, one of the two, that's written by someone who claims to have been there in Matthew. All right, three out of the four. But we like John. John's the one I like. And in John chapter 20, he tells the story of the resurrection. Many people believe John is the disciple whom Jesus loved, so he's the one running second and passing Peter on the way to the tomb in our text today. This is how John tells the story of his experience of Easter Sunday morning. Early on the first day of the week, While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. 
So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we reflect together on your word today, we ask that you would speak. That you would speak words of life and truth, of conviction and hope. Father, we ask that you would speak, for we, your children, are ready to listen. Amen. This story of Jesus' bodily resurrection should strain our belief. It doesn't fit with any of our ordinary, everyday experience. It's the kind of event that cannot be duplicated, cannot be repeated, and it cannot be studied as it happens in order to verify the veracity of it. The Gospels all seem to recognize that this story is going to be difficult for anyone to swallow. It re- for each of them, remind us that some of the disciples don't believe. In our text today, Mary sees the empty tomb. She runs back, and what's the first thing she says? They took his body. She doesn't say, Jesus is alive. She says, they took his body because she knows Jesus should be dead. Peter comes into the tomb. He sees the linens. He he stares at everything. We don't know what he thinks. John comes in. He believes, but doesn't really understand it, he says, but he at least started to believe something had happened. And as if you keep reading the Gospel of John, in the rest of the chapter, the other disciples are up in the room and they're locked in later that evening and Jesus appears to them. But before that, they're afraid and they're not so sure he's really been raised either. Thomas isn't with them. They tell him of seeing the risen Jesus. He still won't believe until Jesus shows up. And Jesus says, fine, put your hand in my side, put your fingers in the holes in my my wrist, and then you can believe. And then finally, Thomas comes to faith. But what's interesting in all of those stories is they are not rebuked for their unbelief. Thomas doubts, he questions, he challenges, but Jesus doesn't rebuke Thomas. Jesus meets all of his questions with the answer that they need. God is not afraid of our doubts. God is not afraid of the questions we might have. God is not afraid of all of our wonderings and our theories and trying to understand what has happened. He willingly engages them all. Because when you, are not, when you not only know the truth, but are the truth, you can handle the truth. And so God's willing to let us doubt and question and wonder. And that's one of the things we can learn from the Easter story. We, we, might, we might talk more again at the end about why this resurrection story matters to us, why we should believe that it's true. That's my bias every Easter. I love talking about why we know this is true because if it isn't true, we're wasting our time, aren't we? If Jesus was actually dead and stayed dead, then this is all pointless. This is the only fact in the scripture that has to be true. It's the only one that is the core of our faith. So we could talk about that. We won't today very much. Instead, what I want to think about is if we know this is true, what does it mean for how we live? If we know that the resurrection really did happen, how does it change us? What does it mean for how we live our lives? One of the first things we notice about Jesus' resurrection is that when he's raised from the dead, it's not like how other people are raised from the dead. Because it happens a lot. We have lots of other comparisons, right? But when other people are raised from the dead, it's different. In 1 Kings 18, Elijah raises a young boy from the dead. In Mark 5, Jesus raises a young girl from the dead. In John chapter 11, just about a week or so before the resurrection, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And in each time, those people again died, right? They were raised from the dead, but then they grow old and they die. They have bodies very much like our own, but Jesus' resurrection is different. When Lazarus is raised from the dead, they have to come and they have to roll the tombstone away from from Lazarus' tomb. Why do they have to do that? They do that for Lazarus because otherwise he can't get out of the tomb. 
he's stuck. You can't roll those stones out from the inside. When you're, once you're in, you're kind of locked there until someone pushes the stone away. Lazarus is in the tomb until they move the stone. When Jesus is raised from the dead, why is the tomb rolled away from the stone? Jesus walks through walls. The stone isn't there to keep him in place anymore, is it? The stone is rolled away from the tomb so that we can come in and examine the evidence, so we can see that he really has been raised. It's not about Jesus, it's about us. Because the stone can't keep him there anymore. We like to talk about Jesus' new body because it's pretty cool, isn't it? Wouldn't you like that? He walks into rooms that where the doors are locked and just kind of walks through the wall. And then he leaves when he wants to. Wouldn't that be really neat? I mean, could you imagine when your kids are mad and they lock you out of the bathroom and you don't know what they're doing? You could just solve that problem. That's never happened in our house. I'm sure not in yours either. And when, when Jesus just wants to leave, he just disappears. He's with Clopas and this other person. They break the bread and they realize who he is and then Jesus just says, I'm going to go now and he disappears and he's gone. Could you imagine when you are your in-laws? Can you imagine? You're like, you know what? I've had enough of this. Boom, you're gone. Jesus could do that. Wouldn't that be awesome? He does that sort of thing. His body is very different than yours, isn't it? Because you can't do any of those things. You can't walk through walls without making a hole in them. And you can't just disappear whenever you want to, even if you really want to. You just can't. Jesus can. His body is different. And we like to talk about that because that's pretty fascinating and cool, isn't it? But what's interesting in Scripture is those things aren't really emphasized in the resurrection appearances. They happen, but what gets emphasized is how Jesus' body is just like yours. And so Jesus says to the disciples, come and touch me. Grab hold and see that my body is really here. I'm hungry. You can have some fish to eat. And he tears the bread. He picks it up and breaks it. He walks down the road with Clopas and the other disciple. He walks to get places just like we do. He has a body. It's real and physical and normal. So part of what Easter reminds us is that God in Christ has not made a way for us to escape this messed up, broken world. He has made a way for us messed up, broken people living in this messed up, broken world to be made whole and new again along with this world so we can live here. Because it's interesting, Jesus is raised and he stays here at the beginning. He belongs here. I'm going to run out of water. I might steal Jeremy's water. <laughs> <coughs> I apologize. And so our Christian hope, if we see this physical body of Jesus, is not that one day we'll die and go to heaven and have some disembodied perfect existence. Jeremy's so nice, he's going to get me water. Or he's just leaving because he's bored. One or the other. He's making an excuse. I don't know which it is. His wife sent him because she's the nicest one here who heard me. All of you heard only one person acted. Thank you, Kim. I noticed you sent him. You didn't actually get up. Good for you. <laughs> but one of the points of Easter is that this physical world matters and that our hope is not that we'll escape this physical world and go live on clouds and strum harps in heaven, but that one day we'll be raised like Jesus was with glorified bodies like his and we'll live here in this world. And that has two significant implications for us. The first one has to do with how, how we live our lives, specifically how we think about life. And the second with how we relate to the world. First is simply this. You can relax. You can relax. For a lot of us in our lives, we spend our lives trying to make sure we don't miss on anything good. And so we spend our lives running from one activity to the next, one thing to the next, trying to achieve more and more, trying to get everything accomplished that we want done, to have more and more stuff and better and better experiences. You are my favorite staff member today. 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 It would change tomorrow, probably. Whoever got me water tomorrow. We can relax because we are not going to miss out on anything in this life because we're following Jesus. We don't have to spend our lives desperately striving to make sure we get the best job we could ever hope for. We don't need to spend our lives des desperately striving to get the girlfriend or boyfriend that we want or get married as if that's the meaning of life to be married. 
We don't have to have the perfect vacation. We don't have to worry that if by, if by following Jesus, we'll miss out on the good things, the things that we long for and want. Because if the resurrection is true, if we too will be raised like Jesus was, and remember, Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, this is what Paul writes about Jesus. He says that when the perishable has been clothed with, clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. That was 15, verse 54. I wasn't mean to quote that yet. That's coming up in just a minute. In 15, verse 20, Paul says that Jesus is the first fruit, which is a, a farming term. How many of you are farmers? Yeah, me neither. No one raises their hand when you do that anymore. So a lot of these farming things don't make sense in the Bible to us. In the Middle East, there was, and in Jewish tradition specifically, there was a tradition in Jewish tradition of the first fruits, the festival of the first fruits because they had multiple growing seasons. And the first growing season, they would grow wheat, which was the one harvest you could count on every year. And God told them, when you bring that harvest in through a huge festival and give it all to me and eat it. Eat it all right away and give the rest away to me. And then trust me to give you the rest of the harvest that you need. So the first fruit, that first harvest, was the down payment on the rest of the crops that God promised to give them for the rest of the growing season. It was a huge act of faith. Think about what that would mean. It would be like if God said, take your first three months of your paycheck and give it all away and trust me to keep you employed the rest of the year. That's what he was saying. Who's up for that? Right? That's what it was. So take your first fruits, the one thing you can count on, give it all away, and then trust me to give you the rest. And that first thing they gave back to God was the down payment. It was God's promise he would give them more. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20 that Jesus is the first fruit that he's the down payment of the resurrection to come. And so what we see in Christ is the sign of that harvest, of what we will be like when we're raised again. And so when Christ is dead and is then raised, he's the point. He's the hope that we have, that we will be like that as well. And so if that's the case, that's we're going to be, if that's what we're going to be like, in some radically different way on this earth, then we can relax about having to achieve everything because we're going to have an eternity in bodies that are better than the one you have now. And so maybe C.S. Lewis has it right in the book, The Great Divorce. In The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis tells the story of a man who dies. It's a, a, an analogy of sorts. The man dies and he finds himself in a bus station. In the bus station, he can choose to get on a bus to go on to the new heavens and new earth or to stay and move out into big mansions all by himself, which is... C.S. Lewis's version of hell to live all alone in a big house. So that's his view of hell. They keep moving further and further out. They don't like their neighbors. And so the man said, he chooses to get on the bus. He goes out on the bus. And when they get to the new heavens and new earth, he gets out of the bus. And he looks at all the other passengers and they all look translucent. You can see through them. And he looks at himself and he realizes he can see through himself. And the grass though looks solid and he comes up to, to a daisy and he tries to pluck the daisy from the ground and he can't. The daisy is too strong for him to pull it up out of the ground. In fact, he pulls so hard that his hands get cut on the stalk of the daisy. He can't even twist it. He can't break even a petal off. It is too big. He tries to pick up a leaf that's on the ground and it's too heavy to lift. He's dripping with sweat when he finally gives up. Eventually what happens over time is those who come off of the bus begin to get more solid again. And what he realizes is it isn't that when they got on the bus, they became translucent and frail. It's that that's what they were always like. They just couldn't tell. They were always that translucent. They were really never that solid or real compared to the new heavens and new earth that God was making. We've always been that way. We just couldn't tell because everything around us was like that too. Lewis's point is simply this. The experiences of heaven, of the new heavens and new earth and our resurrected bodies will be so much greater than what we experience now. What we see now, what we think is real and good is really like a ghost. It's really like looking through a window. It's really something frail and weak. And so the best glass of wine you've ever had, for those of you who have had wine, is nothing compared to, it's just a hint of how good a glass of wine will be in the new heavens and the new earth. The, the best sunset you've ever seen is 
dim and muted and pale compared to the glory of a sunset in the new heavens and the new earth. The most rapturous experience you've ever had on earth pales in comparison to the smallest experience you'll have in the new heavens and the new earth. That nothing in this life even com comes close to the glory of that life to come. Later in The, the Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis says that Right now, we are like kids who are playing with mud pies in the street after a rain. We're sitting in the mud in the street. We're making our mud pies, and we've been offered an opportunity to go to the ocean. But because we can't imagine the ocean, we're content to live with our mud pies. The things of this world that we chase, that we long for, that we think are the best of life, are mud pies compared to what God is offering us in Christ, when we have these new resurrected bodies. This is the hope of Easter. Second thing Easter tells us is that if our hope is that we won't one day escape this world, but that we'll be remade in this world as it's being remade, then this life matters, that it has profound meaning and value. Injustice and the destruction of this world matter because they stand opposed to the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus is the first fruit of God making all things new, then anything that destroys this creation stands opposed to the resurrection of God. It stands opposed to the work of God. And so abuse and violence and war and poverty and disease and death all stand opposed to God and God's good intentions for the world. And we are called to stand opposed to them, to dedicate our lives to fight against the reality of that suffering in our world. And our lives have meaning because if this world is going to be made new, then God is going to take the stuff of this world and renew it. And the things that we do that bring about God's justice, that bring about peace and forgiveness and reconciliation and love and grace in our world, those things, that's the building material, the beginning first blocks of what God is going to make of this, of this world, how he's going to make it new. And so there are things that we will do today, when you forgive the person who sinned against you, when you give generously to someone who can't ever pay you back just because they're in need, when you choose to love someone who is unlovable, those sorts of things will not just last today, but when God makes the world new again, when you're in that new resurrected body, those things will still be there. The house you built probably won't be. The car you're driving probably won't be. Your clothes will all fade away and they will have holes worn through them. You'll need new clothes. You'll be clothed in Christ and so you'll get your clothes. Don't worry. But the good things you do will last for all eternity. That's what Jesus says when he says that we should store up treasure in, in heaven, not on earth where rust and moth destroy. He says, do those things that will last and endure that God will use to make this world new again. And so as Christians, we should be the ones at the forefront in efforts to end poverty in our nation and in our world, because that will last. We should be the ones who are leading the charge to cure cancer and AIDS. We should be the ones who are building schools and hospitals in third world nations and fighting for equal opportunity and access for all people in our nation. As an observation, maybe we should be the ones fighting to build schools and hospitals in the inner cities in our nation and maybe grocery stores so people can have food in the inner cities where we see food blight, nutritional blight in our own inner cities. We should be the ones fighting for those kinds of things in our world. We should also be the ones who are making great art and making great music and telling great stories and writing literature and making movies because those things that are done well and excellently that bring glory to God, that will last. And so when our band plays really well on a Sunday, I like to think that we'll be singing with them and it'll be like recording. It'll just keep going in heaven over and over when they're at their best, when they're doing excellently for God. When you're singing at the top of your lungs, I think that'll last. Mine may not today, <laughs> but yours will. Those things endure. And so whether you're mowing your lawn or cooking fruit or molding plastic or making furniture, or painting houses, or fixing cars, or doctoring, or lawyering, we should do it excellently because when we do it well for God, it endures. Not for this life, but in the life to come as well. And we should be the ones then who are known not for what we're against, 
We should be the ones who are known for how wherever we go, goodness and mercy and love follow us because of how we live. If Easter is true, then what I've said about how, these, how this world, in some sense, doesn't matter that much. You don't have to worry about missing out because you have a better life coming and that this world matters immensely because the good you do will endure, both of those things logically follow from the Easter story. So the question for us is simply this today. Do you believe Jesus really was bodily raised from the dead? Do you believe it's true? If you do, if you believe it is a historical event that really did happen, you have to live differently. If you don't know if it's true, I would love to sit down and talk to you about why I think it's true. I would love to sit down. Pastor Rick would talk to you too. Jeremy would too. Any of us, one of our elders would talk to We'd be happy to sit and talk to you about why we think this story is true, why we know it's true. If you want, you can do some research yourself on our church website on the front page. Almost all the way at the bottom, there's a link called Reasons to Believe that'll take you to a page with about eight different articles and lectures about why we can believe that this story really is true there's one thing that I want you to get out of today is that it matters whether or not this story is true. But then find out for yourself, do you think it is? And then make a decision. Are you going to follow the one who is dead and raised or not? For those of you who already believe that the story is true, that you've already decided this really did happen 2,000 years ago, let me ask you this question. Are you really trusting Jesus? Not are you giving intellectual assent, assent to some ideas about Jesus? Are you agreeing with some theological statement someone gave you? But are you trusting Jesus, Jesus enough to follow him? To go where he calls you to go? To do what he calls you to do? To forgive where he calls you to forgive and love where he calls you to love? Are you living in light of this new resurrection, of this new life that we've been offered? Because the promise of Scripture is very clear. For all who believe or trust, for all who try to follow this Jesus, even with all of our failings and our sin in our lives, we're still going to deal with and all of our screw-ups. For those who seek to follow, we will enter this new life with God. But for those who reject God and His resurrected Son, God will reject them. And the vision of hell that C.S. Lewis paints that you live in a mansion all by yourself and you keep moving further and further out because you hate your neighbors is not what God says it will be like. It is a whole lot worse. There's a whole lot worse end for those who don't believe. The good news today is simply this. The tomb was empty on Easter Sunday morning as 1 Corinthians 15 would say. We can get that scripture back up on the screen. Can we go, can we go one more yet? Death has been swallowed up in victory, but there's one more after this I want to get to, and I'm drawing a blank on which one it is. 15 verse 20. Uh, Can we go ahead? You ever have one of those days where you realize you didn't follow your sermon outline and they are following your outline up on the screen and you forgot to? Let me go find it and I'll tell you which one it is. Romans 6 verse 9 says this. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him or over us. Death no longer has any reign over us. It has been defeated for us. God offers you today resurrected life, a life without fear of death, a life of hope. Have you grabbed it and not let go? Believe this good news and live in its peace. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We thank you that Christ has indeed died, that he is risen, and that he is coming back again. We pray that you would help us today to live in light of our coming resurrection. To not go chasing after the things of this world, but instead to go chasing after you, knowing that you will give us every good gift, every good experience we could need. And that instead, we might chase after your will. That those things we do in this life, those things we strive for, might truly endure not only for this life, but for all eternity. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.